Okay, everyone. Hello. Welcome back. Very, very sorry for that. We did have a big, huge technical failure. Uh, my computer crashed and we've been trying to recover it. But we are back on here live and if my counter is right. We do still have an hour. Rob Shepard has been very patient with us through this technical. Uh, very sorry about that, Rob. And I don't know who who was asking the last question when we went off the air. So, um, guys, just fire away. One of you, please. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody. Where were we? Yeah, just any of like, go to your next question, please. <clears throat> hey. Kitch, do you have one? My mic is, my mic is muted. <laughs> muted. Muted. Uh, how much do you think a profit motive is involved with the UFO, cons with the UFO conspiracy people? Well, in some cases it is, but I think it's only in a relatively few such cases. Um, what you, if you look at uh, the people who are going around and giving lectures, not just occasionally, but making almost a career out of going around to UFO conferences and such and uh, giving lectures um, or uh, selling large numbers of books, not just one or two here and there. Um, you look at somebody like Whitney Strieber and how many books has he sold? It's uh, truly amazing. Uh, he's written, I don't know, a dozen or something titles, and uh, most all of them have been extremely successful. Uh, so, yes, for people like this, there's obviously a large amount of money that is uh, at stake there, and uh, so it's obvious that you, know, you have to consider that profit motive. Um, but I think it's not that common if the average person goes out and thinks that they see something in the sky and they even reports it or tells people about it. I don't think that's done with any thought of uh, money. It's like I said, only the, the career you follow is so as you, you know, go and give a lot of lectures and write a lot of books and, and, and get paid for it. Uh, there is certainly the, um, the proper motive uh, for people like that. Okay, Kitch, do you want to follow up on that? Uh, sorry, I'm just going to adjust the last audio there. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll go for Sheila. Do you have some questions, please? Um, oh, do you have anything uh, currently that you're working on? What is the, I mean, do you have, uh, what's your current project at the moment? Well, I suppose there's always something. Um, there isn't any one big project I'm working on now. Um, in many ways, uh, when you're a skeptic on any one of these things, UFOs and Bigfoot and so on, uh, in a sense you're reactive uh, in that I'm not going forth and, you know, thinking that there is no UFO, that there are no UFOs. Um, rather, I wait until somebody comes up and says, look at this amazing evidence that uh, I have here, and then I and, and my colleagues, the other skeptics, look at it and uh, we see, and generally we don't agree with that, but uh, we take a look at it. So, uh, in that sense, it, it is uh, fairly reactive. There are some cases that are just ongoing that you're always trying to get more information about. Um, Betty and Barney Hill, as, as many years as that's uh, gone on, more than 50 years, and yet we still there's new developments in it as uh, people look into uh, Betty Hill's uh, archives and letters uh, at the University of Hampshire. So I mean, these things are ongoing, and um, many uh, other uh, you know photos that are still controversial and, and trying to you know, extract as much information from them as possible. But mostly it is a, uh, a reactive kind of a thing rather than um, Proactive. Yeah. All right, Smarty. Uh, hang on. <laughs> um, so, I mean, is there a, you were saying uh, you can actually make a good career out of, well, being a UFO, ufologist like a believer. Uh, is it quite a lucrative career from what you've seen of the, of the people promoting it? For a small number of people, it is. Yeah. I mentioned Whitley Strieber uh, earlier. He wrote in, the, well, he was already a well-known writer of uh, horror fiction, 
uh, during the 1980s, uh, and then in 1987 he wrote Communion, which was basically a tale of alien contact, although he didn't call them aliens, he called them the visitors, but they're, they have all the characteristics of what you know, people claim are aliens. And uh, then he, more books, uh, confirmation, and then some of them were fictional books, fictionalized, but based on fact, and so on and so on. And every year or so, he comes up with another book, and these books sell pretty amazingly well, just amazingly well. And uh, <laughs> so, uh, obviously, in his case, you know, in the case of the late Bud Hopkins, he wrote books, and he also did a lot of things. He, uh, he went around and gave talks. He uh, had the they have these foundations and, and organizations for people who think that they are contactees or who think that they have been uh, abducted. And uh, <laughs> I'm sure there's money in that too. Look at Stephen Greer, how much money he appears to be making all this. Um, yeah. It's like a movie if you go out in the desert, if you want to learn how to make interstellar contact, then you will. For something like two thousand five hundred dollars, you can join a group of people out in the desert at night, where you will find flashlights and lasers up at the sky, and uh, if something winks back at you, well, that's evidence of an interstellar contact. So, <laughs> um, one thing we haven't really touched on in this show is abductees. Uh, what's been your experience? Have you spoken to many, well, alleged abductees and? Just what's your general experience speaking to them? I, I don't, on a regular basis, I don't talk to them, but I have you know, run into many people with UFO conferences and elsewhere who believe they have had contact with aliens or believe they have been abducted. And um, <laughs> obviously, I mean, it's um, in every case, there's no real evidence that the truth um, is the uh, sort of a thing. And in fact, um, some people are making a very potentially lucrative and, and uh, interesting thing to help. Um, you know, Dr. Roger Lear claims to take uh, implants, alien implants, out of people surgically. And uh, of course, what you get is just some little piece of something, and nobody can say what it is, and it does not really appear to be. In, uh, Intelligent manufacturers, but then you know, what an alien would make, like uh, say these things may be um, you know, just a millimeter or two long, and uh, really the body is full of foreign objects. Um, a lot of people have pieces of wood and little scraps of metal and so on that actually get embedded in their, to their arm. And uh, some people could imagine these to be um, alien devices, and then they take. Um, that there's like stud finders. In fact, like you know, you go to the hardware store, and this device is called a stud finder. You put batteries in it, and then supposedly it's, you know, it beats for something. It's when you're going over and you know, finds it, it's basically it's magnetic and it detects the nails inside the wall. Well, they take the same thing and they run it over people's bodies to <laughs> find anything. Or it just as it appears to change, because I guess the electric field. Change depending on you know static fields or whatever different parts of your body, and they interpret this as you know the presence or the absence of uh, alien impact. So there's some, some very elaborate fantasies going on there. Um, this another thing is one: how can scientifically literate you find ufologists? Because um, I remember I used to, you know, I used to have a kind of little interest, and I did buy some copies of UFO magazine, which is out here in the UK. And what I found was there was a lot of kind of quite interesting physics and engineering articles. And it struck me that they do know quite a bit of science, but it's just the kind of the jump they're making from that science to what they're believing. But do you find that yourself that they are actually, they do tend to be quite knowledgeable on science? Well, some of them do. Like I said, if you... If you divide the uh, UFO community up into the two groups of the, of the science fiction, you follow this on the New Age. And the New Age people don't know anything about science, and they just go on and talk about, you know, quantum this, and, oh, well, the, the alien told me that uh, they live at a higher level of vibration than we do. 
scientific. Uh, scientific. But it sounds scientific. They think they're being scientific. Uh, whereas the others, uh, the science fiction ufologists, they may have a good knowledge of science in some cases, but they're just so eager to apply it to to try to make something extraterrestrial. They'll talk all about fusion drives and how you could build something like this and get tremendous energy from it if you could harness nuclear fusion. And in theory, yes, that's true. But then if you start to figure out how much fuel you would have to take if you wanted to go to an uh, interstellar destination at some significant fraction of the speed of light, um, it's phenomenally much, even if you were 100% efficient. And then you would have to accelerate the fuel so that you could stop. Otherwise, it'll just go right past your destination when you get there. So the payload has to include the fuel that will, that will slow you down. So you basically you, you squared the amount of fuel that you need. And um, they, they don't they don't either don't realize this or they don't want to um, go through and actually work out what you would actually have to do to make something like that practical. So it's you know it looks sciencey. It's, it's the it's the sizzle of science without the thoroughness of going through and, and figuring out the whole complete package that goes along with it. Yeah, I, I get the same impression. Uh, I mean, uh, if you look at things like these uh, proposed ideas of how a warp drive would work. You know, the whole idea of creating gravity and anti-gravity fields that warp space so you don't actually have to travel faster than light in order to get from A to B faster than light. Uh, I mean, these are ideas that actually work on paper as long as you don't, I mean, just don't look at how much energy it would require. Right. And, and then these people will basically just say, well, you see, these aliens are so advanced that they have an energy source that they can take care of that, and that sort of solves the problem. So, so they, they get to insert whatever uh, sci-fi technology right. uh, they want if it seems remotely plausible on paper. And take something that seems remotely plausible but ignore the details of how it would actually be done. Or they'll say, like you said, oh, they have some advanced energy source. Well, if you go on to my Bad UFOs blog, and in the um, search box up in the corner, type in the word preposterous, and an article about is the interstellar travel preposterous will come up. And um, it, the idea is, even if we grant that they have, you know, given that E equals mc squared, uh, that's the maximum energy you could get from any mass. And of course, you're going to have losses in terms of you know heat leakage and how the machine is 100 percent efficient, and not all of the energy you generate is going to go into thrust, and not all of your thrust is going to go in the right direction, and so on and so on. But let's forget about all those details. Let's assume they could solve all that. You still calculate the amount of hydrogen that you would have to bring with you to fuse into helium, or even if you could, could take matter and antimatter and put them together and make gamma rays. I don't know how much you're going to put the antimatter in, what you're going to build the tank out of, but it, even if you, or where you're going to get it from in the first place, it's always antimatter. But even well, let's assume that's that's the mere technical detail. Let's assume you have all that. Still, calculate the amount that you need. You still need huge amounts of uh, of fuel to accelerate this, thing. and then you, you, you need to square that amount in order to, to have enough to uh, to stop. I mean, if you have a ratio of I forget what it was, 101 or something. Maybe it was better than that if you could run on that. But, you know, that, you, you, your, your fuel for deceleration has to be considered a payload. You have to yeah. accelerate the payload with an even greater uh, amount. So it's, uh, you know, it, it's something that's on paper, but looks like it might be possible, but when you work out the details, you realize it's yeah. total phosphorus. Okay, someone in the chat is mentioning David I I guess it's not UFOs, but it is a... a David Ike? Yeah. Oh, is that? oh, I like David Ike. Do you realize who the lizard people are? They are, of course, they're, they're extraterrestrials. They're, they're, um, Draconians or something like that. I, 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 I think it's supposed to come to the constellation of Draco because, you know, Draco the dragon, and so obviously dragon people and lizard people have to... Come from that constellation, 
And uh, but anyway, um, all of the, there's a secret ruling society, and of course you realize that the royal family uh, in the UK is are counted among lizard people. But um, and, and in that, that they need to have human DNA. The human blood apparently like enables them to stay in their non-reptilian form, and so this is a, sort of a, an ongoing cannibalism. But we shouldn't feel too smug on this side of the Atlantic because uh, I think many of our uh, families, I think that the, uh, the Bush family and the Clinton family and even Al Gore and a few others are all part of this uh, uh, lizard people. They're lizard people also. So um, I guess we just have to um, be really... Uh, uh, really careful and uh, really vigilant to uh, you know, not, not uh, fall into their clutches. He's got a lot of conspiracies, not just lizard people. I'm trying to remember what they all are. I think they're just standard, you know, Illuminati and um, international bankers and whatever and whatever. But, uh, yeah, he's got a lot of uh, really interesting things. Okay. We'll head over to Sheila. We haven't heard from you for a while. Well, I just, um, I think for the most part, and part of the reason why it's such a, um, like a high dollar area to get into is most people live somewhere in between the really uh, technical science people, you know, the what it would take to actually get there, and the new age people who just think it's all, you know, fluffy, magical, right. um, you know, and I, I think, you know, for the most, for the average person, if they, you know, to, like the, the, the ones who can walk away with a little piece of metal or whatever and think that they've actually got some sort of, um, you know, alien evidence are a lot like the same people who walk away from, like, a psychic fair with getting their aura read or, you know, whatever. I, I think it's just it gives them something tangible to hold on to, um, which is why, it, it you know, it's, it's such a high money-making area, you know, because it just it, it gives them hope and... A, you know, potential tangible evidence, I guess. Yeah, there, there's a, a, an ongoing um, subculture of this New Age ufology. It uh, involves, it doesn't involve so much um, sightings or abductions or anything like that, although there may be abductions, but mostly um, it involves people wanting to contact, um, I'll tell you, each, each one of these people who sets himself up as a sort of a guru, New Age, UFO guru will tell a different story about um, how this, um, you know, this, you know, somebody might say, well, I'm in touch with the Pleiadians, and somebody else say, well, I'm in touch with the, you know, the, the beings from Orion, and so on, and uh, they have these ongoing conferences and, uh, you know, weekends where, you know, somebody will get up, and, and a lot of this will they'll try to tie it in with Native American spirituality and so on, which the you know if you talk to an anthropologist, they'll basically say you got it all wrong. <laughs> so that's not that's not what the Native American religious ideas are. But it's like you said, it's the fluffy, warm, happy, uh, happy thoughts and pixie dust kind of uh, ufology, and that uh, we're all you know peace and love and. It's wonderful peace and love, but you know, if there's a guy out there with a gun, it's not going to stop him. Peace and love. So, um, but it's um, you know, it's it, it's a feel good kind of thing on that that side of the equation. Um, we do have a question from the chat room. It's Skin Doggy Dog. It's the name he is asking. How many people um, that at least you're aware of have you managed to? bring over to the skeptic side with your writings and blogs and just in general? Um, have well, you? That's an interesting question and the, the answer is I really wouldn't know for sure. There are a few people um, who will tell you that they started out as a believer and then started to read some of the skeptics literature, not necessarily mine, but maybe they read a book by Phil Flass or Maybe they read, um, you know, uh, one of my books or uh, Jim Moberg or somebody like that, and uh, gradually they, you know, came over to being skeptical about it. But um, I don't know that I, can, you know, these dramatic these tales of uh, dramatic conversion or unconversion are, are pretty uncommon. So, um, I don't really 
know that I could give any number, but I've, I've talked to at least a few people who have said that I just not help them bring them around. I couldn't take full credit for it myself. I find that there are plenty of people who just, um, you know, that they're they're smart people, but uh, they they're just horribly ignorant, and they're they're exposed to one side, uh, the the wool peddlers basically, and uh, they can actually be turned over pretty easily if you just, uh, I mean, if they just hear the counter arguments, they'll just go. Oh w wait a minute, that is stupid. Why didn't I think of that? And I've actually I just, just uh, I, I've been at this for a couple of years, and I've been getting messages from people saying things like that to me, like, "Oh, why you mentioned something that I hadn't thought of?" And uh, yeah, I was believing something completely stupid. You know, that, so that happens. Well, it, it does happen, but it, it doesn't. Uh, it, uh, I haven't found it to happen that often, and uh, yeah, often. usually once they uh, get started down this path, they build. Uh, so we say they invest intellectual capital in it, so that um, and especially if they told all their friends that yes, UFOs are real. I've seen them. You don't want to say, oh, by the way, I think what I saw was just the reentry of a Russian rocket booster. And they know it was something extraterrestrial. Yeah, and exactly. Especially if they told people, well, I've, I've had channeling of the uh, extraterrestrials, I've been abducted, and so on and so on. And to say, well, you know, really that was probably a dream and has to do with sleep paralysis. Um, they're not going to say that. Uh, no. you know, partly because of the, the intellectual capital they've invested, partly because of the potential embarrassment, saying, well, gee, wasn't I stupid to believe that? And, um, and partly it's just, you know, it's a much more interesting world if, you know, there's aliens popping in and out of my bedroom than if I'm just having silly dreams. Um, something we come across a lot with our guests, and I suppose the kind of uh, approach you must take is you know you're not going to convert you know, say like David Icke, you know, with your blog posts and that, but it's kind of people who maybe have watched a little bit too much History Channel, you know, if it just gets them thinking about it, you know, is that kind of really what, what you should be aiming for? Like, oh, yes, yeah. yes, that's that realistic. Even many of the people, you know, I often go to the UFO meetings and, and groups where, you know, they're mostly believers and... Uh, I don't, you know, go in there and say, you people are all stupid, this is crazy stuff, this, you know, this guy is telling a lie, and so on and so on. Uh, I just listen, you know, I hear some amazingly stupid stories. Uh, we heard uh, the guy who was the, like, the photographer or something, who was accompanying Zechariah Sitchin on his travels around uh, South America and wherever else. And, you know, a lot of interesting stuff, totally. Not much claims I could believe, but... Uh, just listen, and uh, what you can do in a situation like that is you can say, remember when he said such and such? Well, you know what? That's wrong because here's this other fact that shows that what he said there is wrong. And they can accept that. That Okay, that one thing he said is wrong, especially if you can demonstrate. Just leave it at that. So that they, you know, that planted, that seed is planted in their minds, and... Uh, and maybe when they hear there's a similar situation uh, in the future, they'll say, well, that sounds pretty wild, so I better check it out. Uh, I suppose another thing I would like to know is, like, um, say, like, for instance, anyone who's watching this, say, over the weekend, one of our friends, oh, I saw this really weird thing in the sky, you know, what else could it be? How do you approach that, you know, when it's someone you kind of know and trust and they're usually quite rational? Well, you know, it just, uh, I mean, it, it would depend on what it was. Uh, yeah. Often, you know, people are just seeing Venus or they're seeing a meteor. Yeah. And in some cases, if you say, well, you know, it sounds very much like a meteor, what you're describing, uh, sometimes they'll accept that, sometimes they won't. Or sometimes they'll say, well, it couldn't have been a meteor, it did this, it did that. But again, it's um, not all details that, that a person. Remember 
are always going to be correct, and especially if they've told the story to other people several times and told it over to themselves and gone over in their own mind again and again. So, um, okay. but often, you know, people will accept something like that, unless you're, you're talking about the people who are just so, you know, if you're talking to one of these new age UFO people, um, it's almost like a person who is like deeply religious, if they're just surrounded by miracles, you know, when, uh, when somebody is, let's say, a very strict Catholic or something, and they, you know, everything that they see, you know, this uh, favorable this or that, is, uh, oh, God did this, God did that, you know, because that's... Uh, Part of their mindset, and uh, these new age uh, UFO people. I mean, if you tell them that you saw, you know, a, a U channel aliens last night, they, they wouldn't question that at all. Because I mean, channeling aliens, and it's just something that people do every day. You know, so it's, it's part of their uh, mindset. And uh, if you said, "Well, I saw a UFO hovering over my house last night," um, they're not going to say, "Well, it was probably Venus." They're going to say, oh, yeah, I saw one about the wish to go, too. So, um, yeah, there's many ways that people will interpret these things. Uh, we do have another question from Camille. Uh, just to let everyone know, we're coming up for the last four minutes of the show, so it is quite a good question here. Um, how do you feel mm -hmm. with the, if, like, say it was confirmed that there was aliens tomorrow, how do you think that would affect the culture? Um, just in general. Well, it would be the biggest news story of all time. So, yeah. I mean, if we mean that if aliens were actually here, as opposed to if aliens were like contacted by say, you know, on radio, or, um, if aliens were actually here, I mean, that would be the biggest uh, uh, news story uh, of the time. In fact, there was a TV uh, show about this. What was the name of that series where they suppose I can't even recall it now, but. Uh, Few years ago, where they, you know, the premise of the show was that aliens had come with their technology openly, and it changed everything. But then, you know, also, you know, the question is, can we really trust what these aliens are telling us? So, yeah, it would be a huge, complex, um, and amazing thing. But you know, it's uh, pure speculation at this point in time. How about if it's just uh, a radio signal? What do you think would happen then? I think it would still be profound, although there would be no immediate sense that you know everything is going to change. That next week we'll be we'll be living a different kind of life than we're living today. Um, but we would undoubtedly uh, try to extract as much information from it as we can. Remember that because of the enormous distances involved, uh, it would not be a two-way link, or at least not for a very long time. I mean, if they're say, 100 light years away, which is still relatively close. Uh, even if we send a, an answer to them today, it's going to be 100 years before they get it, and then another 100 years before we hear them say that they got it from us. So, but I could imagine that over very long periods of time um, that we might set up something like that. Say we discover somebody who is 200 light years away, and we, we establish a two-way radio link. And of course, this is something that takes place over many you know, centuries. But I could see that we would maybe give a beam our encyclopedia, our data, and our you know information about our culture and our planet to them, and they would do the same to us, and that you know this would be ongoing. I would think. Uh, we're just coming up, on, so I think uh, probably the last question to take us out there. Uh, what kind of materials or books in general would you recommend for anyone just wanting to get involved, started with skepticism, to build their skeptical skills? Well, there's a lot of uh, things, uh, a lot of ways to do that. A lot of information, a lot of um, organizations have uh, information for you. Um, in the U.S., um, we have uh, the CSI, I mentioned. Uh, they publish a magazine called The Skeptical Inquirer, and uh, it has an online presence. You, know, you can also you can go to Facebook, for example, and you could like the Skeptical Inquirer, and then you will get little news updates and things from them. Same thing with the Skeptic Society in California, which is uh, Michael Thurmer's group, and they have a magazine that you can read um, online. Also, I believe I, mean, I believe they have like a, a Kindle version of it, and uh, they also have online um, Facebook and uh, information and things. 
Jay Rep with the James Randy Educational Foundation, and um, they also have online uh, materials. And they have um, if you can make it to Las Vegas in July, that's like sort of like the Woodstock for skeptics uh, of uh, you know, each year um, at one of the large casinos in Las Vegas, and uh, more than a thousand skeptics get together and have a great big party. And usually, Penn and Teller are there, and uh, all kinds of very interesting people. So if you want to have a lot of fun and make a lot of skeptical friends and get to know a whole lot more about these things, uh, if you can make it to the amazing meeting or TAM, that's uh, something I would highly recommend. Um, there's also there's uh, skeptical um, organizations uh, in the UK, in Australia, I mean, in almost every major country. There's, uh, I know in Italy, uh, some of the Italian skeptics come to our um, meetings here in the U.S. and uh, I'd say find out what you know in your country is some of the largest uh, skeptical organizations and uh, join them. See if they have anything online that you can read. If they have a magazine that you can read, and perhaps even if they hold a uh, conference where you can get together and uh, meet people with uh, similar uh, thoughts as yourself. Okay, we're coming up to the end of the show, so as always, I'll just go around the panel for the final thoughts. I'm just going by the order you appear on my screen, so Marty. Yeah, um, I, I've got something, except uh, it was great to have you on. Okay, um, Thank you. Sheila. Uh, well, I guess uh, thanks for the opportunity to let me not only have me on here, but to get a chance to uh, listen in on on Robert's, what Robert had to say. Very cool, thank you. All right, John Kitch. You're muted, Kitch. You're muted. Muted. <laughs> As always. You've gone Dalek on us, Kitch. <laughs> you're, go you're going Dalek on us all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> Got an Irish Dalek on the show now to finish it off nicely. Uh, Many thanks for coming on. It's been really good to have you on. Okay, I think the uh, new you new or new <laughs> or say exterminate to be sure, just to give us. I'm not. How about now? Yeah, you're still the same. Uh, just mute kitchen, Jim. <laughs> uh, that's an odd. That's a great way to end the show. And uh, yeah. Robert, uh, you. Your final thoughts, please, and any soapbox stuff you want to do right now. Uh, well, uh, not too much soapbox, but uh, <laughs> not too much soapbox in here. <laughs> um, I would say if you, uh, if you want to stay in touch with what I'm doing, um, read the Bad UFOs blog, badufos.com, and uh, also uh, look on uh, Facebook for some of the uh, you know, Skeptical Inquirer, Skeptic Society, JRAP, and so on. Um, that's how you'll um, stay, uh, keep in touch, I would say, with new um, developments. And uh, if anything really significant or interesting comes up on UFOs, I try to uh, put it onto the Bad UFO blog and also some human. Okay, um, big thank you to Rob. It's been a fascinating discussion. And uh, coming up for you, we're back on Saturdays, and next week we are. Mr. Matilla will be joining us, which is sure to be, if you remember what happened last year, it's going to be interesting to say the least. So, uh, thank you all, everyone, uh, everyone chatting. A uh, big thumbs up to Rob, and we'll see you all on Saturday, same time. Good night, everyone, and have a great weekend. See ya. Bye, everyone. I suppose there's always something. Um, there isn't any one big project I'm working on now. Um, in many ways, that when you're a skeptic on any one of these things, UFOs and Bigfoot and so on, uh, in a sense you're reactive. Uh, in that I'm not going forth and you know thinking that there is no UFO, that there are no UFOs. Um, rather, I wait until somebody comes up and says, "Look at this amazing evidence that uh, I have here," and then I. And, and my colleague, the other skeptic, look at it, and uh, we see. And generally, we don't agree with that, but uh, we take a look at it. So, 
Uh, in that sense, it, it is uh, fairly reactive. There are some cases that are just ongoing that you're always trying to get more information about. Okay, everyone. Hello. Welcome back. Very, very sorry for that. We did have a big, huge technical failure. Uh, my computer crashed and we've been trying to recover it. But we are back on here live and if my counter is right. We do still have an hour. Rob Shaper has been very patient with us through this technical. Uh, very sorry about that, Rob. And I don't know who who was asking the last question when we went off here. So, um, guys, just fire away. One of you, please. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody. Where were we? Yeah, just any of like, go to your next question, please. <clears throat> like I said, only the, the career you followed you, so as you, you know, go and give a lot of lectures and write a lot of books and, and, and get paid for it. Uh, there is certainly the, um, the proper motive uh, for people like that. Okay, Kitch, do you want to follow up on that? Or? Uh, sorry, I'm just going to adjust the last audio there. Yeah. Uh, well, we'll go for Sheila. Do you have some questions, please? Um, oh, do you have anything uh, currently that you're working on? What is the, I mean, do you have, uh, what's your current project at the moment? Well, yeah. Um, you look at somebody like Whitney Strieber and how many books has he sold. It's uh, truly amazing. Uh, he's written, I don't know, a dozen or something titles, and uh, most all of them have been extremely successful. Uh, so, yes, for people like this, there's obviously a large amount of money that is uh, at stake there, and uh, so it's obvious that you, know, you have to consider that profit motive. Um, but I think it's not that common that the average person goes out and thinks that they see something in the sky and they even reports it or tells people about it. I don't think that's done with any thought of uh, money. It's Kitch, do you have one? My mic is, my mic is muted. <laughs> muted. Uh, how much do you think a profit motive is involved with the UFO, cons with the UFO conspiracy? People. Well, and in some cases it is, but I think it's only in a relatively few such cases. Um, what you, if you look at uh, the people who are going around and giving lectures, not just occasionally, but making almost a career out of going around to UFO conferences and such and uh, giving lectures. Um, or uh, selling large numbers of books, not just one or two here 